here on the podcast today with Navy veteran Shannon Bray, who is running for North Carolina's lieutenant governor as a libertarian candidate. His background covers history, cybersecurity, specializing in election security, computer science, and information technology systems. For the past 30 years, he's made his living as an entrepreneur implementing technological solutions for the federal government and has worked for several of its agencies. So with Shannon's um, extensive educational background and his insider perspective as a veteran, as someone working for the government, we're hoping to find out from him what he knows about how government works and what his vision is as Lieutenant Governor of North Carolina. Shannon, welcome to the show today. How are you feeling? I'm feeling great. Thanks for having me, guys. Fantastic. So um, before the recording started, you were talking a little bit about your original plans for how you were going to structure yeah. your election. Yeah. Yeah. So um, originally, because I had ran for the, the Senate, uh, I ran a couple, a couple elections in a row. And ideally, I was going to take some time off because there wasn't a Senate race. But then some people in the crypto community was like, hey, you're our favorite politician. Just you always talk about, you know, the benefits of crypto and stuff. Mm -hmm. We'll we'll support you if you pick an office and run and we'll 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 help you out. Um, so I was like, all right, well, a friend of mine's already running for governor. I'll see if I can slide in the lieutenant governor spot. So then I went to the party and was like, hey, guys, I think I'm going to go ahead. Because I told him I wasn't going to run. <laughs> um, I said, hey, guys, I think I'm going to go ahead and probably do the lieutenant governor. It looks like something that the campaigning should be fairly similar to, to what I've done before. And in that meeting was uh, uh, D. Watson and uh, a couple leaders from both our North Carolina party and then Wake County as well. And they were like, well, we've looked at the bylaws. And we think that there's a loophole we would like to exercise. And they were like, oh, yeah, t tell me about it. And they were like, well, we'd like you to run against Mike uh, and primary. Now, the reason why we like primary, because we hardly, as libertarians, we hardly ever get a primary. Because we don't have enough candidates out there to, to cover. But when you go into an election cycle without a primary opponent, they ignore you. You don't get invited to anything. Hmm. Um, no way. I mean, you'll get mailers and stuff to kind of, you know, uh, express your views so that they will figure out who they're going to endorse, but they never endorse libertarians up until, up until recently. And we'll, we'll talk about a few of those, but, uh, so we get ignored and people don't even know we're running up until November. They go and say, Oh, you know, I, I didn't know this person was even running, um, because they never make any of the news bites and things like that. So as soon as I said, okay, well, let's do that. Then all of a sudden, Mike and I are both getting invited. We've done a couple TV spots already. So, so interesting. We, we already had more exposure than, than we would have. So okay. the, the, the bylaw pretty much says that if someone drops out of a race, that the party can select a person to fill in that role. Right. So Mike and I ran under the synopsis of whoever lost would most likely fill in the lieutenant governor and that D would hold that spot for us um, and then and then drop out. But she's also in charge of our party or um, she's one of our party leaders here in North Carolina. And that's a lot of work for her. So she already knew that she was going to be. Um, slammed if she was trying to work both so, the, the inside party stuff and then also the, the campaign. So trail. to clarify this, you were you were intending to um, take the lieutenant governor candidacy if you lost the main yes. governor candidacy and, and you don't fear that that would have created contention between you and Mike because you would have been going from um, having to run against each other to having to be on the same ticket again, essentially. Well... <laughs> We always knew that we would be on the same ticket. Right. Um, and then as we talked, I was going to take some less libertarian stances. Okay, interesting. To, to bring in outside voters. Right. And a, a lot of those were my, my school choice. It's still school choice that sounds much like the Republicans, but I okay. use some words that are Republican friendly in mind where where Mike went straight libertarian for his. And then, so we did that for a, a couple things. And 
I there there's a couple big differences between us, um, and we just kind of wanted to see where a the libertarians of North Carolina wanted to vote, but then also how many people could we get from outside of that. And some of our some of our major differences, because by and large we're 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 very similar in everything, but. Um, I took a different route on the transgender approach. I see. Um, We're going to get to that. We okay. have questions about that later. Um, Matt, do you want to take it away with the first planned question? Uh, yeah. We have, this is Matt's question. Okay. Um, what is libertarianism in your eyes, and what made you decide to like commit to completely run? Uh, to complete the run of uh, for office, or yeah. just... Just just when, when you first decided to run. Oh, um... Well, a libertarian to me is, so we have this simple mantra of don't hurt people and don't take their stuff. Everything that we decide or all of our decisions are basically based off of that simple mantra. So if you ask me where I stand on a policy, I may not know until I hear out the whole thing and I'll, it'll come, does it hurt people or does it take their stuff by force? And if it does, then I oppose it. Um... I was raised as a Republican and uh, was in the Navy, a combat veteran, uh, saw war, and war made me anti-war. So mm-hmm. as, as a, a civilian adult who I work for, you know, many, many federal agencies and whatnot, um, I was sickened by the amount of bombs we were dropping on brown people in other countries wow. and that my money was going to it. Um, case in point, uh, Afghanistan, Biden just got elected. We had 13 service members die and they came out and said, we don't really know who did it. It's going to take us months to figure out. We're going to investigate and then we're, we're, we're going to retaliate. And then the next morning, we drop a bomb on an Afghan family who was loading up water into the back of his car, had nothing to do with it. And, you know, the administration was just like, oops. Well, we shouldn't have oops like that. I mean, we killed a family and their kids, and it gets chalked up to oops. So, um, I'm... While, while I appreciate the technology of drones and stuff, you don't get the intelligence that you necessarily need um, to make good decisions. So that's just one, one case of many to where it started driving me more anti-war. And the Republicans are very, um, and the Democrats too, right, are very, very pro-war, no matter what they say. Uh, and we see it as we give our tax dollars to uh, various countries, right? We, we pick, I see. we pick the various winners we want, right? Whether it's Israel or Hamas, right? Or, uh, Russia and Ukraine, uh, Turkey. I mean, we have, we have like 50 different escapades that we're, would we're you, in right now that we're, we're paying for. Would you go further and say that you're not only, um, anti-war, but, anti-interventionism because I'm a very, very, um, um, behind person when it comes to geopolitics, actually international relations was my major at some point, And I found it very hard to tell like what was just a cliche that was being said and what was actually relevant to policy. And so I switched to economics and haven't really looked back since then. But I remember the way people would phrase, um, debates about war and security is whether the United States had some sort of duty to intervene, especially if it it was a U.S. interest that was being affected or if it was upholding an ideal. So say, for example, in the case of Afghanistan, where there's this argument that, well, for the Afghan case, we both have a national interest there because the Taliban is a security threat to the U.S. And also we're upholding the ideal of not letting a Taliban government run the region. That seems to be the debate that was, or at least how it was sold to the public of how the intervention in Afghanistan was advertised. Mm-hmm. Do you think that the public is simply being lied to 
when issues are framed that way, and how would you change that framing? They are, and yeah. I do agree on um, anti-interventionist. That's that's better. That's better stated. Uh, the act, uh, so the Taliban. Uh, do you know how they came into power? No. Tell so uh, Ronald Reagan put them into power. We armed them in the eighties. Was this part of like the Cold War to balance against yeah, the Soviet against Union? Russia? I believe wasn't it? Uh, yeah, we were arming them and training them so that way when they fought against Russia. They would be better prepared. Yes, and what we found over the years is everybody we we arm and train sooner or later become our enemies. So um, the Taliban—that's the birth of we we created the Taliban ourselves. That and bringing our Western values and trying to impose it on people who um, aren't welcoming to that to that way of life, right? Just. Uh, people always say mm-hmm. democracy is the best, uh, the best way to live. But to be honest with you, gang rape is a democracy, right? You have wow. Uh, I mean, can you further life, explain that? Right? Yeah. I mean, you've got five, six people who all decide that their needs are more important than, than the that one person. So it's an extreme utilitarian view of ethics where tyrannical majorities yes conform. Yes. Yes. So I mean, depending on how you look at it, um, you you're basically having a group of people who make decisions to hurt people or to take their stuff, mm. right? We have the same thing in our in our tax codes, right? A lot of people say, oh, taxes are are needed to fund a proper society. And right. While some of that may be true, try not paying your taxes and see what happens, right? And then you have the IRS showing up. And eventually they'll take your stuff and they carry guns, right? So it's not a, you're being forced, compelled. Um, and when somebody takes your money by force, what's that really? Robbery. I see. Right? Theft. Mm-hmm. Um, so inside the libertarian circles, that's why we say taxation is theft, because you're taking my money, you're applying it to something I don't want you to apply it to, in this case, war. Um, and... You're forcing a government to be molded exactly. that, that didn't occur naturally. I mean, I, w- I don't know if I would agree that democracy is necessarily um, there at the core of this debate. There's the question of when is utilitarianism appropriate, uh, thinking about ethics, thinking about the greater public good, and when is um, individual rights and and showing the primacy and inalienability of individual rights more important. And so as that applies to sovereignty, when it comes to countries, uh, what I understand is that a lot of the regimes that the U.S. backed up, for example, when I spoke with Steve Feldman and he talked about the Shah of Iran being a U.S.-backed dictator that greatly favored Western interests, I wonder if sometimes the idea of spreading democracy, the idea of protecting ideals and protecting human rights is is something of a veneer. If it's even really possible to do this when, like you said, other cultures might have a very different conception of human rights. I wonder if you can you can speak to that. Like, what was the ideological driving point for intervention in in Afghanistan? Well, Afghanistan popped from the the towers yes right? the when on September 11th you know that was our first go-to and then we have Iraq which was highly questionable right right that's they didn't actually cool. have right um there were no weapons of mass destruction but yet and it, this broke my heart because I was a big Bush fan both Bushes right this yes what I was uh I was actually serving in the military uh I call him Bush senior even though I know it's not that <laughs> I don't know it's not as technical title, but, uh, you know, I went, I went to war for him and I was a huge supporter of his son. Um, and I looked down on Bill Clinton, who was actually the only presidential president that was able to balance our budget, even, you know, as a, as a Democrat, right. he balanced our budget and, um, you know, our Republicans and stuff, they all they keep doing is, is adding more to it. You know, they, they always preach that they are for small government, but in reality, they're for large government of control, hmm. right? Being able to control the border, being able to control you, 
you know, they they push back a little bit now on the on the IRS and, and stuff like that, but they wanted to take the funding for all the IRS agents and, and create uh, border security agents for that. Um, which then you've got armed combatants, you know, pretty much at our at our borders where ninety five percent of the people trying to come through uh, aren't here to for for malicious acts, hmm. right? They're just looking for a, a place to live, to, to to get out of the the dangers of their of their homeland and and to come here. So for you, their rights as individuals is more important than the perception that we have that the government is needed yeah, who, to I get mean, who involved. Gave, who gave the government the right to make these decisions? I mean, in the case of Latin America, like a lot of Texas and California used to be part of Mexico. I wonder, taking that idea of, of the right of an individual to the extreme, though, um, I mean, do we ever have an obligation to support our state's idea of a greater good, or would the state ever have um, an obligation to support our idea of the greater good? If, say, for example, someone runs for office on ideas which they believe will benefit the public welfare. I mean, especially with your background as an armed forces veteran, I wonder, would you take the belief that the individual is always, the individual right is always more important to the extreme, so to speak? If the or individual it... is not hurting other people or taking their stuff, I feel like they should be able to dictate their own terms and how they live. I see. Okay. And I don't think that any community has the right to impose their will on that individual. Uh, what about private property, though? Oh, um, I'm big on private yeah. property because the state's taking all mine. Mm -hmm. uh, I have a house in Apex. I have cars. I have all of this stuff that I'm not able to touch right now because of some some court said I couldn't do it. So oh, wow. uh, in August of last year, just because of eminent domain or, or something like, well, that? it was in August of last year, I told my wife I wanted to get separated. I found out she was sleeping around with a guy in the neighborhood who was an army recruiter. I'm and sorry. I just told her that I, I was done. I wanted out. Uh, I told her I had proof on my phone and that I wasn't going to leave her with anything. This flipped her. I mean, her, right. her her, she went. And she broke her marriage vows. Yeah, but you. then she, because she thought then she was going to lose everything, she she attacked me, and I had recently just had a right shoulder surgery. Uh, so not only, in order to get my phone, she pulled the titanium rod, mm. um, separated it, she took my phone, she then also went to the, the police department and um, pressed domestic violence charges on me. Holly Springs PD came in, was like, no, there's nothing, you know, we, they talked to the kids, they, 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 they talked, uh, they interviewed me, they decided that there was nothing there to pursue, um, but then, so then she went down to Wake County, um, and told them that I, um, tried to kill her, um, so they charged me with, uh, felony strangulation of a, of a, of a female, and, um, what else was it? Um, communicating threats. Oh, and then also manufacturing and distribution of marijuana, which was kind of a complete I separate see. thing. And would publishing this on the podcast um, uh, impact the legal proceedings? No. In any way? No. no. Okay. No, so I mean, I've been found innocent of all that. You've been found innocent. Yeah, yeah December see. 6th. Um, or December 1st. Wow. They, they found me innocent of domestic violence. All of my 25 plants that they were trying to charge me for as, as a felony were all hemp. Um, tested as hemp. They they dropped all of those. I ended up, I did take a uh, possession charge under an ounce. Um, but even being found innocent, she had gotten a protective order, which is civil, on my house and the cars. And... I'm not able to go back and get those until I go to court next month and fight wow. that judge. So it seems yes. like going through the justice system has impacted your perspective in a very real way about what government is, uh, you know, able to do when it tries to adjudicate yes. is, between people. That is some shady stuff right there. So you have a combat veteran who risked his life for his country. He comes home, tries to take care of his family, 
but then you upset your wife who then weaponizes domestic violence laws and leaves you with nothing. They didn't give me, we had two cars, right? They're identical cars. They're both Lexuses, just different colors. She got them both. Uh, she got control mm -hmm. of the house. I can't even go to the house and get my computers or anything that for, for work. I was running my own company at the time. All I was, I, I, all I had was a laptop. I see. And that's all I have now is a laptop. And, thankfully, and there's no, it's not like the laptop benefits her in no, any way. Well, it's, right. It's only a laptop that's, you know, useful because you're, it holds the data for your business. That's right. what you use. Well, and it didn't even have wow. like, the ones for my business are all, I have like 20 computers in my house that I can't get to that had all my customers and stuff like that. So I went for months not having, she had my phone. I couldn't call my customers. I didn't know their numbers. Um, not only did she have my phone, but then she used it to set off house alarms and stuff so that they would come arrest me for protection order violations. Oh my goodness. Uh, yeah, she threw the whole, the whole thing at me. Um, and, and with that, uh, I mean, I got out of jail the first time after spending two days for domestic violence yes. and my shoulder was completely screwed up. Mm. Wow. So I went to the ER there in Apex and they're like, your shoulder's trashed. You got to have an emergency surgery, come back tomorrow morning at 6 a.m. Here's your medication you need to, to, to help with the pain. Um, they sent me to Harris Teeter where uh, I get my prescriptions. They sent a text message to my old phone, notif which notified my spouse that I was about to be at Harris Teeter. She met me there with cops and they arrested me for... Because she went into your way intentionally so she could say that you were going yes. into her way. Well, she used my phone to set off the house alarm while I was in the ER and then told the DA I was harassing her. So they were like, go get them. So that was protection order number one. Um, so I just got out of jail. I just got out of the ER. Now I'm back in jail for two more days with a broken shoulder uh, no medicine and nobody's helping me. So I get out of jail and I immediately hear that there's another warrant out for my arrest. So I, I leave town. I'm, I'm then bounce out to Charlotte, um, trying to stay out of Wake County as, as much as possible, uh, until all my court dates and stuff were resolved. And all of that, it was behind me, but it didn't stop the WRAL story you know, of, um, they had a nice 10 minute story on me talking about, you know, my, my political background, uh, and playing it up for you as it seems, w but then talking about my domestic violence and, and, and the marijuana, uh, mm. as soon as I was found innocent, nobody would run the story. <laughs> so I was and, no, and no one would correct it either. Yeah, no. No, because if you go back and you look at them, one will say that I was arrested three times in a week. One says I was arrested twice in a week. The truth was I was arrested twice in a week and then arrested oh the third goodness. time a couple weeks later. I see. Um, mm. But yeah, I spent eight days in jail for something that I didn't do. And I'm still unable to go to my home, which is my private property, which is kind of how we got on this. Yeah. yeah. Um, so yeah, no, the state basically barred me from my own property and one of the things that I want to do is make sure that they can't do this to other law-abiding citizens. This actually brings me to one of the questions I wanted to ask but first thank you for telling that story and uh, you know trusting me uh, and Matt to convey that story to our listeners. Uh, I'm very happy you were found innocent and I, I just hope the situation gets resolved. Yeah, I have another it's, month, yeah. and then I'll hopefully move back into my home. Luckily, I have a Navy buddy that I'm staying with here okay. in, in mm -hmm. Angier. Um, you know, put out put out the old helping hand. Yes. And, you know, when when everything was taken. From and I, first, though, I, I want to ask: Has uh, you know, um, political activism, being involved with the libertarian community, kind of been an outlet for you? Because I've known people who, when I worked um, for Sea Change, a harm reduction community, who were um, charged criminally or were going through the court system, and they found that people, who, being an activist and being able to work on policies with people who had gone through similar experiences, 
really, really helped them regain their sense of self. And so I wonder if liber the um, be running for office and you know working with your campaign and working with others in the party has helped you to regain your sense of self. Oh, absolutely. Because like they were really the only people that was there to help me. Really. Um, my basically my campaign team was like, we know that that's not you. You know, we don't we don't believe that. Um, and so they were they were my backbone, even when everyone else. They didn't view you as a liability, right? Because of um, now, had I been found guilty in December, they would they would have dropped me. Yeah, uh, because you know, as libertarians, we believe in the non-aggression principle, the NAP, right? right? Um, and you know, ch choking your wife out is uh, a violation of the NAP policy. Yeah, I guess so. <laughs> so. I'm not very libertarian if that's how I handle yes. myself. Yeah. I, I see, I see. This this actually really brings me very well to the next question I wanted to ask, um, which is the idea in the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence that all men are born free and equal. And how can government best uphold that principle? Because there are some who stress, and I think libertarians fall into this category, that Equality under the law and equality in negative rights is what government is best suited to uphold. So it's the freedom from, um, if you understand what I mean. Mm -hmm. um, or does freedom and equality mean that we should strive to create a society in which um, opportunities are spread more equally? This would be a view of, about positive rights, like you have a, a positive right to have health care, even if you don't have the personal resources, or you have a positive right to have education, even if you don't have the personal resources. And I wonder how have your experiences informed you on that debate? It seems like you understand I do. what I, I'm trying to ask. Yeah. One of the negative aspects to the positive swing brings yes. in affirmative action. Okay. Right. So now you may not be hiring somebody who's best qualified. You might be hiring the disabled veteran the black guy, the Indian mm -hmm. guy, the Mexican guy to fill in a, a quota, right? No matter mm -hmm. whether or not they, they are the most qualified or not. Um, so I believe that the affirmative action is actually contributing more to our, our racism in our, in our country. Uh, now sure. I don't know why yeah. it's there. Opportunities weren't giving, given to a, a lot of these people. So they're trying to, give them opportunity as they become older. Um, but that's not necessarily the, the best for that's it, not necessarily. It can, yeah. It can me. contribute to the idea that, well, if they need an extra leg up, does that mean that they're inferior candidates in the first place? Because it, uh, I think I agree that affirmative action is very divisive. Mm -hmm. Um, and you know, my perspective, I'm half Hispanic and half Asian American. And so in the past, I kind of blatantly took advantage mm -hmm. of affirmative action because um, even though I wasn't the best in my class, many other people um, in my class got rejected from applying to the top universities. Um, I went to Northwestern University and honestly, you know, without, I can't say this for certain, of course, because that would be an assumption, but I think affirmative action probably played a very large role in that. And I didn't end up uh, continuing at Northwestern anyway. But what I found is that um, when people apply for jobs that they're overqualified in, uh, there's an economist, Thomas Sowell, who's, who's made this argument, who's recorded this argument in many cases, is that it actually benefits nobody. Because if you're overqualified, uh, then you're not keeping up to speed. Um, and he you know, cites his experience as a professor at Cornell where he had students who he let it, who were let in um, and were below average the other students, and then they didn't keep up to speed, and going to that elite university wasn't actually beneficial to them mm -hmm. because they were in an environment where the classes, I mean, it's simply the case that if classes are moving too fast, then you're not going to learn as well than if you're, in an, if you're in a learning environment that's more uh, suited to your abilities, then you can actually retain what's being taught. So on affirmative action, I agree with that. But my, the gist of my question is more about um, uh, more about public services, more about, um, say, for example, Norway's public option system, which is a very strong public health insurance option. And Norway still has a lower debt to GDP ratio than the United States. 
And so if the government can do things in a positive way that might be more efficient than the private market or might be more fair than the private market, does it have an obligation to do that? So list me one thing where you feel like the government does a better job than a private industry would. I don't think the U.S. government does a better job than the private industry. Yeah, so let's, 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 let's go. Yeah, stealing our money. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> So healthcare, the reason why healthcare is so expensive now is because the government has put their hands into it, right? They have, um, they, they go through and they make all these policies with, I mean, big farm is way into there. And if you don't, if you don't believe that big farm and the U S government are walking hand to hand on a sandy beach somewhere, you just got to look back to COVID yes. right to where forced vaccinations, um, shutdowns. Um, lack of individual choices and all all of it really became more of a, a big pharma attack on the U.S. population. Now, by and large, you're like, well, what? Well, people had COVID. You had to do something, um, you know, to kind of stop it. But there are studies out there that the use of marijuana blocks the COVID receptors. Oh, wow. I didn't know this. Yeah. I happen to, you know, cause I'm a daily smoker. Mm -hmm. uh, I never got COVID. It came through my house twice. Yes. Um, and I've, I've never, never <laughs> had an issue with it. Um, so had I been president, you know, whether instead of Biden or Trump, instead of sending out all the stimulus money, I'd right. probably send out, uh, you know, quarter pound of weed. <laughs> <laughs> to everyone, you know, smoke up, Johnny, or you know, here, here's your edible for the day, or whatever. That would be an immensely popular <laughs> yeah, that's a, a policy. Um, I, you know, I can. Can uh, I say one more thing? Yeah. So I'm, I'm, um, actually health recently health insurance licensed, mm -hmm. health and sickness insurance licensed in North Carolina, and so what I've found is that there's a lot of distorted incentives in healthcare because due to the system of uh, creating HMOs and PPOs to manage the cost of care, what that has actually done is even though members of one insurance company or one subscriber group get a discount, then healthcare providers are no longer actually competing to gain market share because they know that they have a guaranteed customer base with the subscriber group. And so the healthcare system in the U.S. is not very competitive. But if there could somehow be a system, whether it's based off the Nordic model, which I think has very admirable qualities, where um, companies are competing to lower their costs, and maybe there could be co-insurance so that people have skin in the game, and they're looking to seek better, um, better deals for themselves to get the most of their money and not waste money, on unnecessary treatments, then could the public health option still play a role? So I think it could, but I want to say in, yeah. in your statement, you said three times was competition. Yes. Um, the United States has removed all competition for health care and for a lot of the other services that it provides. Yes. Therefore, we're paying out the nose uh, for things that and a lot of it may be cheaper for some a small segment but then more expensive for others but it's complete lack of competition mm -hmm. and without competition we're not going to have the best markets so that's where most libertarians will come in and say you know we can strive under competition right mm -hmm. this is actually what builds great economic systems so if the government wanted to stay in it which i would be opposed to but as long as they allowed for competition and not the monopoly, then I think they would be better suited. Interesting. That's a, that, um, that's a very good answer. I don't really have anything more specific to add because I wanted to see what you think. Although I do think there are some libertarians who'd probably be more extreme and say that any government interference at all will automatically kind of lead you down the road to serfdom where then the government takes over because the government naturally has an ability to outcompete mm -hmm. since it has public resources. Though I want to move and on. Guns. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I was, I was going to say real quick with you saying, uh, with COVID, uh, I know, I believe it's Rand Paul that's going for COVID accountability. Uh, as Lieutenant governor, is there a way that you would be able to assist in co trying to get accountability for mm -hmm. the people that have misused 
Uh, absolutely. Yeah, and uh, I'm a big, big Rand Paul fan. And I appreciate him so much going after Fauci and all the stuff that they're... They basically pulled back all the drapes and said, uh, hey, this, this the whole thing was a farce, right? In fact, wow. we don't even talk about where COVID originated from was, guess where? China. The United States, 1970s. Oh. We shipped that stuff over. Oh, really? Yes, we did. So I'm, we, I'm completely so in the dark on these updates. So, so we originally started on it and then sent it over there to yeah. test. Yeah. So the okay. whole, the whole, yeah, it, it may have came out of Wuhan with their stuff, but the original COVID is, uh, was born in the United States. Are you saying that wow. it's a synthetic virus that it's, uh, yeah. And what was the purpose for creating? I have this? no idea. I see. I, I do not know the news about Fauci or um, what was covered up or COVID accountability politics. That's more like Matt's area of what he reads on. Um, because economics can be studied, I think, like systematically, I, I tend to look more at economic issues. But if you want to tell me more about what you think should be done for COVID accountability, go ahead. I just don't have anything well, to add. Yeah, I mean, I, I, yeah. I would like to see Fauci charged, you know. Um, I don't really know about the the companies who took advantage yes. of of COVID. I'm I'm not exactly sure how they took advantage of it. I mean, even Tom Brady ended up with COVID money uh, for one of his companies. Now me, <laughs> I'm a I was just own my own little business. Uh, I was my primary employee. Yes, and I didn't get squat. Mm. I uh, I applied. Since it was based on number of employees, a lot of people sort of did make shell companies. Yeah. And take actually, this was a huge story that I think wasn't reported on enough. It was that the COVID uh, payments were a huge source of fraud. Um, since the Biden administration wanted to get them out as, as soon as possible, they even though the government accountability organization, the government itself, was warning that there weren't safeguards in place, that there was a massive risk of fraud, they pushed it through anyway, and a lot of that money was lost. Yeah, and then yeah. like the people who could have actually used it, like like myself, right? Um, because I lost all, I lost a large portion of my customers to to COVID, right? Mm. They 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 shut down, so a lot, a big part of my income was was lost. I ended up then going into day trading for crypto, um, I see. and kind of diverged my life a little bit, but okay, um, it that, but by by need though because. COVID has pretty much taken away my, my livelihood. We have plans to ask about cryptocurrency and um, okay. and monetary policy later. But awesome. now that we're on the topics of law and accountability, I want to ask about the Donald Trump case. And one of the biggest debates going on right now is whether Donald Trump's felony prosecution for the Stormy Daniels situation was really a, a politicized prosecution. And I'm really curious, how do we know whether the same standard of law applies to everyone when those in government will inevitably make themselves political enemies. It seems to me that because the, um, the, the prosecution happens to be democratic, the judge in that case happens to be a, dem a strong Democrat, that then this creates the perception that the, the, the prosecution uh, must have a political motive. And since Donald Trump is so famous, since everyone has an opinion on Donald Trump, can someone like Trump even get a fair trial? It's, look, I'm not, I don't like Trump. Yes. But I also feel like he's not getting a fair trial. Mm -hmm. I feel like there's 50% of the country can give a rat's ass what happens to him. Um, and so I think they just kind of went guns blazing. Mm -hmm. Now with Stormy Daniels, I didn't follow everything. Um, to, to the letter, but I understand that, I mean, she has signed affidavit saying that, you know, some of that stuff wasn't even true. Now, I don't know why wow. she signed that. Uh, I just saw on Twitter, people were like, well, this is a smoking gun to get Trump off. And so he still got convicted. Um, you know, Trump, Trump's not a nice guy, right? He's not here for the American people. Um, hmm. But, you know, he, he plays the, he plays the victim rather well, and he, he even though he's a rich silver spoon kid because he got all, most of his money from his dad, right. um, he, you know, people still, because he's on TV and stuff, people still find him fairly relatable. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, I always thought he was an asshole back just when he was on The Apprentice. Um, although I watched every episode <laughs> uh, up until Brett Michaels from Poison, I thought outplayed him on the show. And Donald Trump was like, you're fired. And I was like, you're changing the rules in the middle. Um, <laughs> yeah, no, you're. Uh, and that's that's the day I stopped liking Donald Trump. So it really has nothing to do with the political aspects of things. Uh, because he's right, like on his taxes. Well, if you if you want to go after him for his taxes, mm-hmm. change the tax code, hmm. right? He's not doing anything that I haven't done. I mean, when tax season comes along, mm. and I don't care who's listening, I get on TurboTax and I play that game until it's green. Right. Uh, right. I'll find as many write offs as I can. Uh, I think about that during during the year. Hey, is this? Uh, I run a I run an IT shop. IT covers damn near everything. So phones, you know, computers, software, uh, any subscriptions I get, right. all of that stuff. I I'm able to write. I'm able to write off half my life. Right. And so, am I paying less taxes than somebody who doesn't understand that? Hell yeah. But is it is it a criminal act? No. And I don't believe that anybody should be paying taxes to anyway. Right. So at, at least by at least by force. Um, so I kind of applaud him on on, on that. Um, now I he's always said that he was pro gun, but he's not. In fact, he says that he's pro a lot of things. But then when you actually get down to policies, he'll be like, uh, take their guns and. Talk to him. Talk to him later, right? Hmm. Uh, and he was very. Uh, he he got on the the bump stock band and and all. So he's not two A at all. He might be now though because they just took away his guns in New York, right? He's no longer able to um, uh, carry a gun or sell alcohol, um, all all because of this this felony conviction. Now, does him making a payment, whether or not he did or not? to Stormy Daniels, should that remove his Second Amendment right to protect himself? Mm. No. Lucky for him, he has Secret Service that follows him, and they're well-armed, so he doesn't right. He doesn't have to have a gun. But a guy like me, uh, they take away my gun rights, and now, you know... Now you're armed, unarmed. And I'm unarmed. Just right? so I, can't, around. I can't protect myself. If somebody came up and robbed me, I... What am I going to do? Use my one good arm to say no? <laughs> so, oh, man. Uh, I, I kind of get de- derailed there a little bit. That's okay. I, I apologize. But, uh, yeah, Trump's an interesting character for me because I don't want to support him. But at the hmm. same time, I see things that just doesn't seem like it's entirely fair or... Or the law was written for something completely different, like the anti-espionage law or whatever they tried to get them for the documents being in uh, uh, in Florida. That was a stretch by any imagination. So they take, and he was like 37 counts of whatever this was in his, his last one, I think. They they. They took the spaghetti, hmm. they cooked it for a few minutes, they threw it against the refrigerator, and then they started just jumping on whatever stuff. Because when you look at half those charges, you're like, where did that even come from? And it's, they had to like loop it around some, oh, in in 1910, there was this law, um, and this looks like it could be tied to that, so let's charge him with that. Hmm. Um, and that's the kind of stuff that I was like, whoa, wait a second. That, was, that law was was written to handle like a certain environment or a certain aspect. And now they're mutilating it to cover whatever their political agenda is. So laws are being misused, misinterpreted to, uh, to, to weaponize, right? And yeah. they're, they can't stop Trump. So they're trying to. Right, right. But it, uh, there's a couple states that say his name won't be on the ballot, but um, I think Biden isn't going to be on Ohio now for some weird reason. <laughs> um, so I don't think either side should be playing those kind of games, right? I think the laws should be written to where they're clear, 
they, they shouldn't be 20 pages with loopholes and all that kind of stuff I in see. there. It should be like, don't shoot people. You know, if you shoot someone, you're going to go to jail. It doesn't matter if they're Jewish or black. Uh, oh, well, it does now because if you happen mm. to shoot a black person, well, then that's a hate crime. But if you shoot mm. a Jewish person, that too is a hate crime. So if... If I go out and shoot another white guy, I may only get six years. But if I go shoot a black guy or a Jewish guy, I might get 25 years because it's a hate crime. There's an essay I remember reading um, where a historian argues that in many ways the U.S. And this was all the way back. Now, this essay argued that because we view law increasingly as something that denotes where we derive our authority from rather than everyone having the same universal rights that the u.s is in some ways moving back to becoming like a feudal society and he cites examples of where bills were introduced or laws were introduced where the punishment for attacking someone in office was higher than the punishment for attacking someone who's just a regular citizen and so law is, in that case, used to denote what your power is, what your position is as an official, rather than a universal right as a citizen. And I think what's, what's more of a difficult question to answer, though, is when this involves security concerns or if this involves economic stability concerns. For example, Matt brought up this question about whether people from other countries or the governments of other countries should be able to buy land in the U.S. And recently, this became a big issue um, in Texas. I've seen a news story about Chinese citizens who were prevented from buying land in the U.S. because of potential links to the Communist Party or because of the idea that, well, foreigners can't own essential resources like food sources or food producing land in the U.S. Does libertarianism, or do you personally, as a policymaker, as a policy thinker, think that um, a double standard of law could apply when it comes to things like owning land, or no? I see you're shaking no. your head. Yeah, because we don't necessarily know how these people are, they could, they could, they could be part of the Chinese National Party here, trying, trying to buy land. Um, but how do you really know it's that? It's discriminatory. That's, yeah. Right. You're, uh, the big issue the, that was at play. That's because, kind of like what they did with the TikTok ban or either ban it or force them to sell to another company. Right. For, and TikTok did exactly the same thing to Twitter and Facebook and Instagram. They all do the same exact thing. The only difference was TikTok, even though they have offices here in the United States, was a Chinese company. Hmm. Right. So that's why they were going. So, yeah. And I think anything like that is a violation of our First Amendment. Um, see. But I, because I, I believe that and I believe in the Ellis Island immigration policy. Right. If you want to come to the U.S., you're not a dirtbag. You can pass a, a, a background check. I think you should be able to come in whether or not you're whether or not you have a sponsor or not. Yes. Um. And now, at the same time, I'm also against welfare, right? So mm -hmm. you, you, you can't, you have to change the welfare program with immigration because right now they're kind of tied hand in hand. Uh, you have immigrants who come in who then are on welfare and then that's pulling off of the, mm. the American people. I, I, I oppose that. Right. Well, because I oppose paying taxes right. for government services. Um, this is where I think the private market and stuff would do a lot better introducing the competition, hmm. no matter what service it is. I see. But, um, there are people who fall in hard times and there are a lot of, uh, privatized, uh, companies that, that help people out. Red Cross for one. Um, hmm. you, you know, if, if something happens to your house, uh, or you're in a war zone, you know, Red Cross comes in, they're um, bringing blood, they're bringing money, they're bringing supplies, you know, there's a lot of different organizations wow. that, you know, they, their entire purpose is humanity. Um, so I, 
in the absence of government, I think people will step up um, because government does such a crappy job at everything they do. Can um, bureaucracies, whether they're public bureaucracies or you know private bureaucracies like um, uh, the administrative branch of large corporations, ever learn to spend money more efficiently when sometimes relationships with contractors and relationships with suppliers are often deeply entrenched and difficult to change? And I ask this question because I have some experience working as a bookkeeper um, and also assisting other bookkeepers. And so I see purchases that to me don't look like they make sense if the organization were still actively looking to seek the best deals. And I wonder if this happens in government more than um, private corporations. So I've worked for a lot of different agencies. Yes. Um, and at the end of all of those, we always, if you don't use your budget money, you lose it. So hmm. you're getting closer to the end. That's a perverse incentive yeah. to simply Pizza spend. parties, we're buying new hardware. <laughs> you may have had hardware last year, but hey, you know what? You get new hardware this year. Um, so they spend all of their money uh, and they'll overspend and then ask for more money, even though they really didn't even need it originally, but they just want to have as much money as possible. Because so there's no opportunity cost to spend it. Right. If that's the case, then you might as well spend it. You you spend it, yes. right? You guys, you spend it. If, and to them, it's like use it or lose it. They're like, oh my god, we gotta use it. Well, you're not thinking about the American people and your pizza party, right? Right. Um, you have uh, poor people who their tax dollars are stripped out of their paychecks just so a bunch of IT guys that working for DOD or whatever um, can. Hmm. can have their Friday pizza party. No, I mean, I've done IT parties in a lot of different agencies, <laughs> and they all go off like Microsoft. I mean, hmm. big conferences, big this, big that, and it's like they just spend money. Um, and, I mean, even down to, you know, private jets and stuff. Everyone's talking about how we should be watching the environment and stuff, or all these environmentalists. Right. Like Taylor Swift. For, for instance, right? But she flies around on her on her little G5 all, all over the place and gets mad at somebody on Twitter who's tracking her, saying how much money she's spending and, and, and how much the emissions yeah. and stuff. Because wow. like, from my understanding, like something that would be like a 30 to an hour drive, she'll fly in 15 minutes. And it's like, but yet you're telling all of us that we either need to pay a tax to save the environment or to buy an electric vehicle right. that some of us can't afford. Right. But to, to actually try and answer the question, though, since, you know, some, I, I believe some bureaucracy is necessary because some organizations, some established institutions just have to exist. Given that that's the reality how can how can bureaucracies choose to be more transparent or choose to spend more more effectively? Well, they can choose they be redesigned not to be transparent. I mean, let's look at the North Carolina GOP law yes. right now. Right, they are the Republican Party is trying to push through that each um, each person in office has the ability to classify their own stuff so that it would never see the light of day to wow. the to the voting population. That is bullshit. Is that just in North Carolina or is that also nationwide? It may be nationwide, but I know North Carolina is doing a push for it right now. Okay. Um, now, see, at the national level, if something is is uh, actually uh, for national security, I understand that, right? I was in the military. You know, I don't want the plans for these planes or our new tanks that the army is just coming out with, that stuff shouldn't go to the Chinese. But whatever um, this auditor or whatever up in North Carolina, who's not even, who may or may not even have a statewide office, should they be able to classify their stuff? No. I mean, what, for North Carolina security? I don't really understand what the... No, they're hiding stuff so that they don't have to be held accountable yes. for it later. So one of the things that uh, I'm going to do as lieutenant governor, one of the jobs that if Mike gets elected 
and he's already said he's going to task me with is is uh, blockchain. Right, not even for the monetary uses of it, but oh, wow. having a transparent government on blockchain to where everything is reviewable. Yes, um, and that's the where um, I th I think things should be. I mean, we have seventeen intelligence agencies. I've worked for like five of them. Um, they all have different little jurisdictions and in nuances, and they all have different rules on how they can treat the American people. Um, well, they shouldn't be able to spy on us anyway. This is a good conversation, and we're going to ask something about blockchain in a bit. But first, there's another huge topic that I want to ask about that we haven't gotten to at all. So sure. I'm going to I'm going to pivot this a little bit. Um, you, if I'm not mistaken, have stated you're in favor of reinstating the gold standard. Is that yes. correct? Yes. And the conventional narrative I've learned as an economics student. Um, and the type of narrative you see in like a political science textbook is that the gold standard inherently became untenable because it doesn't allow central banks flexibility in providing liquidity. And so the U.S. left the gold standard because it had to, because Nixon had to in the 1960s. I wonder, would you agree with this narrative? I mean, I'm sure you don't, but how would you challenge that narrative and why? Because what you just said about they choose not to be accountable, they choose not to be transparent. So it's also, I think you would say the same thing is true about the gold standard question, that they choose not to be yes. on the gold standard. And so why is that? Ooh, um, well, because, see, now you're able to manipulate the monetary system. Yes. Just like we do now with the Fed. Yes. Right, we're under complete manipulation. And inflation is basically just a tax on poor people. Right, because mm -hmm. uh, well, I'm not rich anymore, um, but when I used to have a lot of money, I didn't care what the price of milk was, right. whether it was $5 or $8. Um, I didn't care if gas was up or down because I just had enough money to pay for it. But now that you know life is kind of taking a toll or whatever, now it, I actually care what I spend you know, at the grocery store. And why, why does milk, why, get, why is it $3 more now than it was a couple years ago? Um, why is... And just refinance my house that I'm going to move back into. And now it's, I had 7%. Where, where did that come from? Um, and it, it's all, we're just overprinting money. I mean, we're just constantly printing yes. money. In fact, I heard somebody on uh, this, this poor girl was on, maybe it was TikTok and got reposted to Twitter or whatever, but she's like, I don't know why our politicians aren't smart enough just to know that all they have to do is just print more money and the world will be better. <laughs> right. Just, just print more money. And, you know, and I can't really defend anything that she had in that conversation because she doesn't understand how not being on the gold standard, having the Fed be able to manipulate and us just being able to print money and do whatever we want. Because that would just make it less valuable. Yeah, it, well, and that's really what's happened, right? Our dollars become less value, and I foresee a collapse of the the dollar, you know, within the next decade or right. so. Right. What I've learned is that certain investments, like, for example, housing, are vehicles for the rich to park extra liquidity when the Fed creates more liquidity because it's not a straightforward process the, where the government – just chooses to spend money. It instead, it puts new money in circulation by buying back assets, by buying back its own assets, buying treasury assets. And this is what's termed liquidity creation. So for example, in 2008, when interest rates were very low, so there's more money being netted into the economy than money is taken out, that money went to housing and it contributed to the housing bubble because the rich took that and parked it in that investment vehicle. And my thinking is that we're now entering a cycle where the government becomes more and more involved in propping up the capital markets and propping up fragile, too big to fail banks. Because in the pandemic, they started holding corporate bonds as well as traditional assets. Uh, when Silicon Valley Bank failed, they, there was talk about expanding the FDIC insurance to cover those deposits and I think that now people in government have this assumption 
well, the most important thing is to keep employment going and to keep the economy going, no matter the cost. Mm -hmm. And that's because the cost is dispersed rather than uh, centralized to one person. You don't see it as a tax when the cost of items go up, uh, but it really is a tax because there's some people who benefit from it, the people who benefit from extra liquidity in the economy, and everyone else who doesn't benefit from the higher inflation. And so given that more and more of these economic and monetary decisions are centralized by the Federal Reserve, by the federal government, how would you as a lieutenant governor support fiscal responsibility, at least on the state level? We've talked about introducing the North Carolina dollar, which oh, really be on the gold standard. Uh, so a separate currency that's not the U.S. dollar. Yeah, that's pretty radical. There would be yeah. there would be so much. Yeah, yeah I don't think the would, Finra that the um, uh, the Federal Reserve Board or that any of the regulatory agencies would support you. Would it in be, that? Uh, my question on that too would be: Would it be physical or like in the crypto? It'd be physical. Okay. Yes. Because even crypto has to be backed physically. Yeah. Um, but no, no, I don't expect the Fed to support me at all, but right. I don't support the Fed. One of the first things that as, you know, when I was running for Senate, uh, and my friends that are run for, you know, president is the end of Fed. You know, it's, <laughs> it's pretty much going after these financial, um, uh, manipulation institutions yes. and bringing back the gold standard. I mean, I mean, my, the heart of my question is how do you anticipate dealing with that opposition? Do you have experiences where people try to dissuade you from that position? The They probably would try, but I feel like that everything that I believe is based in principle. Yes. And along with most of my libertarian friends, right? We're all principle-based. Whether we like something or we don't, we we acknowledge the underlying principle and give give weight to, to that particular principle. And... That's something you don't necessarily see in the the other two parties, right? You'll see Lindsey Graham for one, South Carolina senator, right? If you if you watch his videos from ten years ago on one topic, and then you watch the same topic of when Trump was uh, elected and he's done a complete reversal, right? It it basically says that they will say whatever they want to say to help them win at the time, and when it comes to you know, our monetary systems and things like that, we don't have room for hypocrisy. Um, we should just have a set rule, set rules of, of how things work, whether things are backed up, like in this case with gold, um, because all the money that's being printed by the Fed, right, that, that's, that's just paper. Right. It's worthless. I think leaving the gold standard behind has probably hurt us more than than anything wow um because now we have people who think all you have to do is print more money <laughs> uh, i mean it, economics would be easy if that's all you had to do yeah right you, you imagine oh, yeah. you, you got one day class oh just print more money you say, oh you get an a <laughs> well i guess i guess what's interesting is that it does work in the short run because there's not a one-to-one -one, um correlation between new money printed and price increases. And what I mean is if, if the money supply were to increase 50%, I don't know if prices would necessarily increase 50%. It's not one to one. Right. So it's more, so that's why the cost is dispersed of printing money because it might make goods more expensive later on if supply issues become constrained or it might not make things more expensive in certain circumstances if the economy keeps growing. And, but, and so that's why I think people don't understand the cost of printing money. I think the idea that we can separate what is supply side inflation and demand side inflation is kind of like a very, very weird idea to me because all of it will eventually be linked in some way eventually. Matt, do you want to ask your question here before we move oh, on to the next section? Yeah, uh, I was going to ask, uh, how do we balance the fact that we have obligations to care for like veterans and people who worked hard for Social Securities? Yeah, I believe that Social Security should stay in place, but get weeded out for the people who have paid into it. Hmm. I also believe 
that we should be taking care of our veterans because we, each one of them, gave the government a blank check that included up to the loss of their life to protect our country. Now, whether or not they actually protected our country isn't on them, right? A lot of a lot of our combat vets got sent into war for political bullshit. Um, and now they, they're coming back, half of them are maimed and broken. I, I believe that they should be made whole. They should be taken care of. Even though, because um, I'm not anti-military. Uh, I'm anti-political wars, right? But I believe in defending mm-hmm. ourselves, right? So um, I just don't think that we should be going in and telling other people how they should be living the United States telling other countries, but I also don't believe that government officials here in the United States have the right to tell American citizens how they should be living, right? right? As long as they're not hurting people and taking their stuff, then they should have no control over the individual, which is not where we're at. We're not a free society, no, no matter how we try to say we are. There's, there's one last question about economics. And I guess um, monetary freedom that I want to ask and uh, credit to Matt for bringing this up to me because he told me that there's a type of cryptocurrency called a city coin designed Mm -hmm. to benefit local governments. And from looking into it, it really interested me that these city coins are voluntary use and it's sort of like taking the idea of voting with your money to a new level by using the city coin uh, to donate a portion of their of their revenue to the city. Um, However, at the end of the day, people tend to spend money, right, as rational consumers in a way that gets them the most bang for their buck. And so if I'm understanding city coins correctly, and it's relying on the individual to pay into the city for what they want, I mean, why would anyone ever do that if it's if it's money that they could save for themselves? And would the revenue from city coins ever be significant enough to impact policies or to entirely fund policies? So the first city coin I knew of was Miami. Yes. Um, there's been a couple others since then. Miami, New York, and Austin. And how are, how, how are the other two doing? Uh, I think New York and Austin. New York, I think they said, like, like raised $10, $10 million the first day it was on. So yeah, I, I'm a big – in fact, I'm on my platform somewhere, I probably mentioned the city coins. Even though I'm against centralized – banks inside the crypto space i think city coins are are different because then you have the people who live in that community who instead of paying taxes could contribute to the city coin um but then at the same time there's a lot of things that a city can actually do to generate revenue right Mm -hmm. and to actually become a, a working business instead of oh, wow. um, instead of it being more of a because right now it's just sucking off the resources yes. of, of 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 people yeah I think the government should be ran like a company and not like a government um, that the mayor or whatever should be the equivalent of a CEO of that particular company right and not but but not use taxes as as their as their revenue go to because right now it's all, Oh, we'll just raise taxes and then we'll, we'll pay for that with your tax dollars, whether you like it or not. But a lot of times you get a vote for a tax in, right. But you never, whether that program is successful or not, hmm. you never get a reduction, right? Oh, we had this program didn't work. Uh, they just keep on. We just, to right. Yeah. We're going to get rid of this, hmm. but we're keeping your money. Uh, just, just in case. Just, yeah. Just for, for whatever. Um, but I'm a big fan of the, the city coins. I would like to see that in, I would support that in North Carolina as, as like a, uh, as like a test bed. So like, uh, how would you implement that in North Carolina? Like, would it be for certain cities or would you, as your time as Lieutenant Governor, try and go across all of North Carolina? I would like to do across all North Carolina, but I don't feel that I think you have to have a beta run somewhere yeah. and, you know, focus either on Raleigh or Charlotte, uh, Asheville, maybe, uh, Asheville would probably be a, 
a really good place because it's a lot smaller. Yeah. They have an excellent VA there. There's a lot of good things that Asheville's doing. Um, so yeah, I would like to see it maybe pilot and then and then roll out. Because hmm. okay. um, this this they use that for for roads. Right. You can use it for education. Um, so a lot of things that people are already given their their money to would benefit that. Now, I also think that it's going to depend on how those coins are set up. Um, right. Are they deflationary or are they inflationary? Anything that would drive in any time that they continue just to print more city coins and you know, mm. we're kind of going backwards. Right. So it should be pretty much like Bitcoin yeah. to where there is a fixed number of coins. The more you buy, the more valuable they are. That's really the only thing they work. Uh, but if it's more of like a Dogecoin scenario, okay, right? It's um, they just keep making Dogecoin, at, you know, Elon right. big one. So it's more of a uh, inflationary coin. I guess I'm I, I'm still struggling to understand where the value from city coins come from. Is it sort of like investing in the well being of a city where you're expected to make profit off it by yeah. holding the city coin? Yeah. But then the then the incentive. Okay, I see. So it's almost like the like a company issuing equity shares. Yeah. Like it's issuing these coins and as, as an investment that people can make in the community. It's not that these coins automatically get taxed by their usage. Right. I see. Yeah, it would be hopefully there. Then that requires is, significant buy-in. That that's a matter. It of would, and people. that's that's why I mean it's only City Coins have been around now for three or four years, and mm-hmm. they're not necessarily getting. Adopted that fast, but people aren't really looking at crypto as solutions right now. They're stuck in the whole meme coin, you know, what, what meme coin is going to make me rich as opposed to the utility of something. Yeah. Like ICP is uh, uh, internet computer, right? They're out working to make a better internet, a more secure, faster internet. So that that's a business model that you know as you buy and and you need those tokens to actually be on their internet, so right? So you, it's it's got some utility to it. Um, I think city coins should also have some sort of utility to it. So like token holders, yeah, maybe uh, they are able to go do maybe they're able to do free concerts somewhere. Uh, if they hold so many tokens or whatever to, you know, to, to create some sort of value there. I see. Um, as opposed to it just being a speculative a taxation. I see. Yeah. Uh, that, that ends the section on, um, economic questions. And I want to move on to the, the cultural questions sure. about running for office. Uh, I noticed that abortion is on the very top of your issues page. And this struck out to me. I mean, it stuck out to me because it's a very difficult subject to bring up with anyone who disagrees with you. Or, you know, if you don't know somebody's stance on abortion, like it's not something that I usually bring up Mm -hmm. very early in the friendship. It reminded me of once when I went to a progressive religious leaders talk at UNCG and they described abortion as a purely personal decision that nobody except for the woman should have a say in. And I asked a question about late stage abortions that went something along the lines of, well, if you have a fetus that's highly developed that you believe could, you know, start to develop the inklings of sentience and of consciousness, then is, does that change the situation? And this question was not met well by one of the speakers. Another person who was a nurse jumped in and gave a more nuanced answer, but ultimately I didn't get a clear answer. And so given how inflammatory this is, how would you convince someone or ask someone to consider an alternative who has a radically different view than you? Because unlike you, most people don't um, view it as a system of competing rights mm. the way you described it. Well, let me let you describe it. Sure. Yeah. Well, so as, as I run for Senate, I am against any laws pro or against abortion. So I took a completely different stance. I see. But as running for governor or lieutenant governor of a state, I feel like you have the responsibility to the younger, like the the unborn baby competing individual rights, yes. right? To where um, I, I agree with a lot of what they, I believe that abortion is a very difficult decision 
that should be made between uh, the woman. Uh, hopefully, her her partner is involved and and their doctor. Yes. And if there's anything medically that can risk the life of the the woman, um, then I w- without question, I believe that she should be able to terminate. Um, mm-hmm. But at the same time, as soon as there's consciousness and that baby is viable, I believe that um, abortion should be off the table unless there's some some medical reason for it. Mm-hmm. And it's just because now that baby is a citizen of North Carolina, right? And it's my job to protect all citizens of, of North Carolina. Mm. Uh, so federally... I'm out there, I'll say, I don't think that the federal government should be making any laws on abortion. But statewide, I do believe that after a certain time, I think I ended up in the 16-week area. I've talked to a lot of women. I've talked to doctors. I've talked to... 16 weeks seems to to make sense for most people. Yeah. I've also talked to a woman who didn't know she was pregnant until it was one month before... She gave birth. That happens too. She had a very healthy baby. Wow. Um, but she didn't know she was pregnant up until the very end. Um, so there are some weird medical things like that. Now, so if somebody who didn't know they were pregnant, you know, goes into their eighth month just because they didn't know they were pregnant, they weren't showing any signs, you know, do they have the right to terminate that child? And I'd say no, um, because now it's, it's, gone well yeah. past that baby can actually be born um premature now but i think the the ability to uh adoption and and all of that is is on the table right. so my, my i don't flip flop on the abortion issue but when i run federally i will have something worded different than that to where I don't mm-hmm. believe that the federal government should have laws pro or against um, a- abortion. Okay. I see. I don't have anything to add um, to that. I did see on your website, though, too, that uh, you had wrote in a post, I believe, that guns don't kill people, social media does. Yes. Uh, so I was wondering what you meant by that and, like, how would that apply? Like, Because I know down in Florida... Ron DeSantis, I believe, had put minors are being, he, he's wanting to ban minors from social media like Facebook, Twitter, and all that. So, like, how would you, like, see about applying that? So, here's the, here's the interesting thing that I discovered when I was, I was actually writing a paper for my PhD when this, when this topic kind of popped into my head. And I, I owe some of it to Larry Sharp, a uh, libertarian out of uh, out of New York. I was listening mm-hmm. to his podcast, um, and it kind of helped trigger some things. But by and large, the if you look at the political aspect um, of the Republican and Democratic Party in early two thousands, yes, they were v- they really weren't that far apart. Um, everyone was kind of like on the same page. There were just some nuances now. Mm-hmm. But then after the birth of social media, you kind of saw where people of like mind started building these clusters. And it was it, it was like on cluster analysis is where yeah. it eventually kind of showed up. And as more and more people join those little clusters, they become louder and louder. And you'll see over time that the parties kind of shifted away to where there's a big gap now in between the Republican and the Democratic parties, which thankfully you have the third parties, like the Libertarian Party, kind of fits that gap. Yes. But it's the it's the keyboard warriors and the people who get all spun up and then they have their own cliques and and they're the agitators, right? And then if you're on social media for any period of time in those kind of circles, you're finding that you 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 have you know it causes depression, anxiety. There's people who have to take breaks off social media because it drives them literally insane. And then you also have now the world of 
everything being on social media is instant. Right? It's not like our world leaders now are worse than they ever were. It's now we're able to see in lightning speed what they're doing, and we don't find out about it like a decade later. Yeah. So we have a big, our political differences and our ideologies are more into clusters now. And I think, I believe that these clusters are more responsible for um, a lot of our, our gun deaths. And you know, even inside the Democratic Party, right now you have clusters of people. You have, you have your, uh, I forget what they, the, the super progressive people, right? And then you kind of have your middle of the road Democrats, um, yeah. and they're not even on the same page. Um, to where you have the Green Party comes down, which is mostly Democratic, outside, um, and th they share a lot with the Libertarian Party outside the fact that they they believe that they believe in taxation out out the nose. Yeah, um, I, I believe it's like they they believe that taxing for your car because then you're driving on the road, and then taxing per mile, and then yeah, and they just believe that you don't own anything. Right. Okay. They, so they like your property rights or whatever. They're not big fans of property rights because because if they did, they wouldn't be going after the billionaires for making too much money. Right. Yeah. Uh, they'll they'll say that it's a sin or a crime for one man to have all of these resources, uh, that all of those resources should belong to um, a collective group of people. That right, their their little click, their little click, right? Not not some other little click. <laughs> so you got you got weird things like that, and you know we don't really have two parties anymore. Uh, we, but they all get together at their yeah. at the at the party level and invoke the next idiot in that will because because well, this this is a very can I can I step in yeah yeah because I'm I'm very confused. Uh, to be frank, because your article, your post, is about the mental health effect of uh, social media. Mm -hmm. I don't see anything about political political polarization at all. So simply in the realm of social media, you say that all politics were not on social media. Do you, do you think that social media would still be linked with worse mental health? outcomes simply due to things like fear of missing out like you see someone having a better time on you or uh, i mean what is what is the point of this post is what i'm trying to get at is it is it really about political polarization or is it really about social media itself uh well that one may be about social media i may have yeah i may have mixed up two of my uh, okay yeah because uh this one is about because i honestly i frankly have to push back against the idea that political polarization is the same as, as gun violence, if that's what you're suggesting. Because someone can have very strong views, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they're going no, to react yeah, violence. It's, it's tied yeah. to the mental health aspect. Yes. Um, so let's let's bring it back to the, the mental health okay. aspect. Okay. To, let's, let's take a high school kid. Yes. Um, every kid that you know has got, they're, they're on Instagram, they're on TikTok, there are, they're constantly looking for validation yes um that you have some people who are killing themselves nowadays because of these i want to hang off the side of a mountain right and i right. want to show everybody how cool i am when i do it and oops i Ooh. i i've now fallen to my death right we're, we're starting to get more and more of yeah. those um so social media especially in our younger demographics like my kids um plays a huge role on their on their mental health um if whether or not they have so many likes or uh, maybe somebody they didn't like went in there and posted something they they take value in whatever some keyboard jockey said over what their parents and stuff may may tell them um, so I do think it messes with them and, uh, with their, with their mental health. Um, and, and then from there, it just kind of escalates, you know, most of our, hmm. most of our shooters, most of them are, you know, uh, white male, uh, teenagers 
who just kind of feel like they've been lost. Right. Right. Um, now we're kind of seeing some reverses on, well, are we actually? Because it was a transgender girl. I mean, I count her as still a dude. So to to, to frame this as part of the discussion, but... you, you write here, this is the article I'm referring to. I, I have something I want you to consider. After every mass shooting, people cry out for gun control. For weeks or months, gun control is all you hear, and then it goes silent. There are many people who believe that the availability of weapons is why we have mass or school shootings. The thought is that if you take the guns away from everyone, these types of events would not happen. If we just pass a few more gun laws, we will save our children. And then you're right, there comes a time when we need to find the core of the issues and not just slap band-aids on everything. And so I, I liked this article. I found it very thought-provoking because here you seem to be suggesting that some of the violence that we see, the tragic violence from gun violence, um, which is generalized, is, is being caused by availability to firearms, availability of firearms, could actually be diagnosed as a symptom of living in the digital age, right? And I, I guess, I guess my, my only disagreement is that, you know, in every other country I've visited, mass killings are viewed as an American problem, as something that happens in the U.S. I had a, a talk with an Argentine friend once who said that, well, I guess the only thing that Argentina does better is that we play GTS in our homes, or Grand Theft Auto in our homes and not in school. And he made a dark joke in a way that shined light on, hey, like these, these mass shootings are really an American problem. And so if the only variable, like the determining variable is mental health, then you would expect to see these types of shootings in all countries where social media is available. But since it seems like the determining variable is the availability of guns, where in the U.S. guns are much more available, and you also see many more deaths in the U.S. So logically, I would, as a as, you know, as a as an empiricist, I would have to conclude that well, even though like mental health and gun violence is related, the actual determining variable, the causal variable, would have to be the presence of guns, because everywhere there's mental health issues, but not everywhere there's guns and mass shootings. Do you see what my argument is? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, I, under I understand the argument, but there's the, and it's been a while since I've done any of this research. Okay. Um, but there are states that have more guns than any other state, but and still have a lot less hmm. mass shootings. So the argument depends on scale and frame a lot. Right. A lot yeah. of it's based off the context of whatever that particular situation is. But I'm not sure that, you know, um, I, I don't know how social media affects kids in Argentina versus how they affect kids here in the United States, because I think the culture's also different. Hmm. Um, I mean, here you have everything is designer and everyone has to have the best and everyone has to be liked by everyone. And I'm sure that's all stuff that seeds you know across the world but i also kind of believe that we perpetuate that a little bit the, here that the, the US, u.s that's more pronounced yeah i wouldn't that's very difficult to say because in today's globalized world you know conspicuous consumerism i think takes place in basically every every society and so you know to say guns don't kill people social media does well, it's a very interesting argument, but I'm just not quite sure, like, what to make of it. Mm. And so I guess we're going to have to move on from this discussion and talk about uh, what we, the other things we have planned to ask about, because we still have plenty. Oh, yeah. And, um, one of the things, though, speaking of social media, that I recently saw, like, literally just yesterday, that is that there's many people that identify as libertarian are very mad with the Chase Oliver. Oh, goodness. Yes. Like, yeah. Um, and that uh, specifically on Twitter, so I don't know how true it is, but it, it's coming from the confirmed Libertarian Party of Colorado who is refusing to put uh, Chase on the ballot. 
And I was just wondering about like, is it like if you feel like we're seeing like a split within the Libertarian Party now, or is this just backlash from? Because I do also know that there's people that are coming out and saying that they're MAGA libertarians. So I'm wondering if you think it's just a bunch of Republicans saying they're libertarian or like... This is a comp- this is a complicated one, but I'm ready. All right, so we've already kind of had a split in the party with yeah. the Mises caucus versus the non-Mises. Um, and I don't claim any caucus. Mm-hmm. I yeah. work with everyone equally. Um, but I... I understand why why there's a hang up on Chase, even though I I have supported Chase in the past. Yeah. I plan on supporting him in the future, even though there's a huge line in between some of his beliefs and some of mine. Right. Um in fact him and I are quite different in 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 many areas. Now the the Colorado LP, they're interesting. Because they also made deals with Republicans to not run Libertarians as long as the Republican would run on a couple of their issues. Hmm. Okay. So they do a lot of backdoor deals that aren't necessarily Libertarian. So again, some of some shady actions. Yeah. Um, so, and I know a couple of the people in Colorado, and I was surprised. I personally won't drop out for another candidate who just says, oh, I'll, I'll pick up, you know, I'll pick up some more libertarian yeah. things. Yeah. Mm. But at our convention, right, Angela McArdle, the, our, our party lead, did get Trump to say that he was going to free Ross, right? So for a lot of people, that's like, oh, that's, that's a win. We don't typically get enough votes anyway. So if we, we don't like Biden... Um, but that is, that's worth voting for Trump, yeah. right? So you have, you do have some people saying, I'm voting for Trump. Uh, I almost wanted to jump on that train because I too would like to see Ross freed. Um, but I also know how the electoral college and all that stuff works. And it doesn't yeah. really matter what my particular vote says one way or the other. But Chase, his issue is, so he's gay. Right, and that's not the problem with inside the party, but his views on the transgender stuff has kind of isolated him. That's where him and I completely disagree. Yeah. Can you can you specify? What yeah. You mean by so that? Um, he's referred to as a groomer on Twitter. Yeah. Um, yeah, I've I've seen a lot of that because he they said that he's for trans and kids and stuff like that. Yeah, he's for the medication. Um, the blockers and all of that. And I am, I don't care what individuals do themselves. Here's where my line comes. I have two, as of today, two high schoolers. Um, Mm -hmm. My eighth grader just just graduated from middle school. So now I have two girls in high school. And let's say, uh, well, one's a cheerleader. Uh, And cheerleaders are good by... um, girls and guys can do it yeah. equally, right? Yeah. So that's not that big of a deal. Yeah, but no. let's say that one of them was playing. Sports. So let me, let's, let's, and you have a... It's, I think I see what you're getting at. If someone who is a biological male were to join the soccer team and create a huge advantage for yeah. one team or another, then it becomes a fairness right. issue, yes. Yeah, and it also, that person may now be eligible for awards mm-hmm. and stuff that they're taking away the effort that was put into by a biological girl um, and they're giving it to a boy for whatever reason he decided to transition. So you have the swimmer, right? That's been all nationally known. Um, He was a swimmer in the guy side, didn't do well, went trans and he was beaten the best woman by almost like a half Mm. a lap. Right. Um, I know what you're referring to. I don't yeah. know the person's name. Yeah, yeah. and I, I just can't. If I hear his name, I'm like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I know who that is. I feel like he has stolen the opportunity 
from the girls who have applied this their entire lives because he has a biological advantage. I, I, I also heard, though, too, that I believe that they were almost given an Olympic chance, which I feel like would cause a big issue as well because not all these countries that compete in the Olympics are okay with that. Right. There's a lot that this uh, transgender is illegal. Right. Yeah. It, um, but yeah, and we're basically then dressing up dudes to go beat up on their girls. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I'm I'm opposed to it. Now, on the individual level, I believe that you should be able to do whatever you want to do, as long as you're not hurting people and taking their stuff. But unfortunately, yeah. in this particular case, you can actually do both: hurt them and take their stuff. Yeah. Take the uh, MMA fighter who... Mm. Uh, oh, man, don't get me started on that. Cracked three three women's skulls. Yeah. J- just from two punches. Two punches. Yeah. Messed them up bad. I see. Um, so, so there should be lines that shouldn't be crossed on feelings. There's no, no policy I have is based off my feelings. Uh, and we don't go around and make laws. But we shouldn't be making laws <laughs> off how someone feels. Right, we should, everything should be cut and dry. First, first principles. Right. That's to trace back to something. Now, if you want it, if you, if you, if you want to take this medicine and all of that stuff, I'm, I'm for you. But then don't expect the rest of the world to just accept it, though, because that was your personal right. choice. And I don't even care about your pronouns. Right. Um, in fact, pronouns are a huge violation of the First Amendment. So let me, let me explain yep. this one real quick. So let's say I wanted to be called she or they. Well, when you're talking to me directly, you don't say, I don't say she, or I say, if I'm talking to you, I don't say he, oh, yeah. he, he had eggs for breakfast. Is that true? Uh, I don't know. Um, because it, it, it's a third person pronoun. Yeah. So I'm only using he and she when you're not even around. Right. So if you care about a particular pronoun I'm using for you and you're not even in the circle, you're a restricting my First Amendment right to say whatever I want. And but who gives you the, the right to say whether or not what I'm calling you at that point is is uh, valid or not? Yeah, the whole he she thing and, and the pronouns to me, I don't. I don't honor that at all. If you look like a dude, I'm going to call you a dude. If you look like a chick, I'm going to call you a chick. Right? If And then and, and if you come in with a deep voice like, oh, it's so, please call me ma'am. I'm a trans girl. I'm like, no, you're not. I, I You're a guy who took drugs to manipulate your body, but that doesn't change you bi- biological, right? Your cells yeah. are still male cells yeah right with the absence of these drugs you are still going to have a beard um or not i don't don't have (laughs) you you know it's um so chase is for you know those those medicines yeah and i am not i believe that you know the human brain doesn't fully develop until you're 25 years old that's Mm -hmm. been well established that really should be the point to where we're considering, you know, a, an adult versus kids kind of. But, you know, the voting age is 18. You go to war at 18, so you yeah. should be able to make choices mm-hmm. at 18. And actually, I think it's 16, because once you start working and you're paying taxes, yes. you should be considered. Yeah. And as soon as they start taking your money, too, you should be able to vote and have your have your say. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, Chase... Chase has had a couple interviews to where it sounds like he's a groomer. I disagree with him on all of his transgender. It sounds couple. like he personally is is a groomer. I or he's in. So what I what I'm trying to understand since I I personally don't follow this type of political news as much as Matt does, but Matt brought this to my attention and showed me a tweet from the Libertarian Party of Colorado. And so I wrote down a note paraphrasing the tweet. And what I wrote was that what the Libertarian Party of Colorado was saying is that while Chase Oliver was saying that gender affirming care was a personal decision, LPCO members were pointing out that the network of public school officials, public health bureaucrats and billion dollar pharmaceutical companies created perverse incentives to pressure kids to make irreversible decisions. 
And so um, later what I discussed with Matt is that this split could become so big that it impacts the chances of libertarians being on the ballot nationally, that it sets, sets libertarians back by 10 years. And I'm not, the, I'm not the guy who follows political currents that closely. So this this discussion is all very new to me. And so I wonder, would you agree with that? I agree with that, the, tweet, that the simply, that tweet. I agree yes. With. Okay. But would you agree with the idea that simply because of um, disagreement on on the cultural issue of how to view trans people, that it it could set the Libertarian Party back electorally? Like, is this a hill that the Libertarian Party wants to die on in order to determine the future of the it's party? It's not one that I'm going to die on. Right. Um, because we're we're completely ignoring the rest of his stances. I see. He's he's uh, anti interventionist right? Mm-hmm. Completely anti war. Uh, wants to get rid of the Fed. Everything else that comes out of his mouth, I agree with. I just don't like his transgender stance. So why is the the transgender issue such a big issue that it's enough to divide the party? To where it hurts them electorally. I guess. I guess. I. I really don't understand like why that this is such a salient issue. Because one of the electoral things, politics. One yeah. of the things that I'm thinking and I've I've seen is if the Libertarian Party were to get a president in office in the United States, it would be this election because you know you got two independents running, you got Green Party running, you got pe- Democrats that's tired of Joe Biden, you got Republicans tired of Trump looking for other choices and i i feel like a split like this could be very it's a sweet spot yeah yeah it, it, and it could blow the whole chance of a independent or libertarian from getting office yeah and unfortunately half our libertarians are ready to vote for trump either based off of hmm. free ross or their anti anti chase uh i'm going to support chase he's going to get my vote hmm. I will, I may do an event with him on Friday, actually, when he comes into North Carolina, but I, uh, I, I can't agree with him on, on the whole transgender stuff and it's not even debatable for me because I mean, it's my, I have kids in high school yeah. hmm. that this, this affects. Now, yes. they don't know anybody in their school that are trans, right? It's not like even uh, applicable to to them yeah um now there's a lot of people that are all pronouns right like Hmm. they they want there's so many pronouns i don't even (laughs) know it's not he she they it's like there's i mean there's so many little z's and zys and i I don't even know what that is is. (laughs) um (laughs) so they're spending all their time focused on on that and it's a complete waste of 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 their time but it really comes down to the safety issue. Right. If I, other than that, I don't think I care. Right. Mm-hmm. Uh, I wouldn't do that to my kids. I don't think somebody else should do that to their kids. I think if someone, I would like to see the age of 25 because back to the, yeah. the, the mental aspects of it, there was a Navy SEAL who trance um, several years ago into a woman, wore his uniform as a woman, you know, that had a little bit of backlash hmm. on it. Um, they called him the first female Navy SEAL, which I completely disagreed with. <laughs> um, but he's later detransed and said it was the worst decision that he's ever made. I, I've hmm. been seeing a lot of that, too, where kids, or at the time they were kids when they transitioned, and then now they're like, I don't know, because now, now there's, I can never, like, specifically for women transitioning, trying to transition to men, they're like, I can't have kids no more. Uh, I've, I've completely lost that ability. So it's like, I can't even start a family and I'm only 22. Right. Mm-hmm. You've completely ruined whatever life you could have based off of, and based off of how they're feeling on the inside. Now we've all, I mean, we're, we're all grown adults now, but I mean, when you think back to when you're up, in high school and stuff, we all feel like we were isolated. We all feel that we maybe didn't fit in, right? We all go through situations like that. And I don't, I don't feel like, you know, switching your sex is necessarily the, 
the right answer. There's yeah. so many better avenues out there, but I think it's become a fad, unfortunately. Mm. Like, because you have people who have no desire for a sex change who are all jumping on the pronoun stuff, mm. right? They just want to be included. In fact, they just recently changed the gay flag. Well, it's not really, it's, I don't call it the gay flag uh, because it's, uh, it no longer represents gay people. Um, cause now they've, they've, they put so many different things in there to make it all inclusive, to include the black community and all of that. Well, libertarians by and large are not collective people, right? We're individualists. Yes. So we're fighting for the individual person, not whoever is joining this particular community. Yeah. But the, the, the lesbians, the gays and the bisexuals have been pushing back on the queers and the trans and the queers and the intersexual because they don't all have nothing is the only thing about the about them that's the same is the banner that is flying above their yeah. head yeah um they disagree i mean even within their own circles they'll call like many of these trans people you know groomers and stuff and if you're sitting mm -hmm. in front and this is where I, I totally disagree with chase because he was asked specifically about instances where you have um a man dressed up like a woman reading to kids in a classroom and he was completely okay with that uh and me i i i oppose that um not just reading but you know when when you when you see some of these things you know, and the way that they're they're dancing mm. and, and all of this other stuff. It is, ex I mean, it is extreme sexual behavior that shouldn't be allowed in these I schools see. anyway, right? Mm. But is now being okay just because there's a dude that says he's a girl and... So uh, for fear of looking bigoted, then people suspend their critiques of, of, what's, of what's morally appropriate. Yes. Yes. Yeah, and I think that's by large what's happening because there's a lot of people out there who feel like, oh, if I say anything, then I'll be a bigot. Wow. Well, that's where I come from. I mean, I, it, it'll be like, well, I'm going I'm to I'm speak it. I'm and so is this, is this the core issue that's really dividing the Libertarian Party right now? Is it just this or is it kind of linked to other I believe, cultural issues? I, so I've looked at the differences between the Mises Caucus and like the Radical Caucuses and all of that. And it re, as far as I can tell, the Mises side is less supportive of the trans agenda than mm -hmm. some of the other ones. So this, this is party splitting. I see. Um, I wish it wasn't, but, uh, I don't even know why it's in our agenda because we are individualists, right? And we, we yeah. don't speak for a community of people ever. Mm. So I, I would like to survive this election cycle and see who our next nominee is. Yeah, I see. But yeah. I, I, I still, I, you know, I've sat down with Chase. We've talked for hours, you know, um, and we'll spend more time together. That's just that one. One. I'm not a. a lot That's of surprising to me. Yeah. Single, single topic voters like some gun rights or abortion. You know, they'll vote whatever that that one is. I'm not a single issue person. Mm. Well, actually, I am. I'm a personal <laughs> liberty, right? Yeah. That's mine. And so I support whatever runs out of his mouth. He has the right to say it. Yes. Um, people have the right to take those drugs. I wish Big Pharma wasn't involved. I don't like it. But as governor, I'm not going to allow that in the school systems and, and play in competitive sports. Mm -hmm. right? If somebody just wants to transition in high school, good luck. You know, have, have fun with that. Um, and hopefully you're accepted and everyone loves you no matter who you are. Right. Uh, yeah. And what you're trying to do. So I'm not anti-trans, but yes. I am, I am, I don't want it pushed into the face of the children. Hmm. Like it's no big deal because it's a big deal, right? right? It's, I mean, this, you've got, you've got adults who can't quite figure out everything, let alone these kids who are, you know, being introduced to topics that, um, you know, I frankly didn't have access to until I was 16, 17 years old, hmm. uh, already 
graduated and was in college before that. So it's it's I don't believe the kids should be on the drugs though. So. Um I, I believe I, I don't think that they should be doing anything that's going to be irreversible. I fear in 10, 15 years from now, we're going to have such a huge backlash hmm. from all of this. Um, and I'm basically going to be like, well, if you're the individual who chose it. I supported you then, and you're stuck with it now. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, is really how I plan on moving forward politically. Now, Mike, the candidate for governor, it's like he's not going to ban anything. Right, he's taking the libertarian. Yes, banning things are bad. Yeah. Uh, so banning guys and girls sports to him is is bad. Hmm. He's gonna let the whatever sport it is dictate yeah. that. Which you know, and I I see that uh, as well. But at the same time, his kid is homeschooled by him, and I have girls who you know play sports. Yes. Yeah. So okay. that that's. If I didn't have girls who played sports, I may not even give a shit. Um, but I'm looking at, I, I looked at life from their eyes, you know, if, and the other kids like them who work so hard in their sports, right? And I would just, I would just hate to see someone's hard work taken from them by somebody who didn't apply themselves yeah. mm-hmm. as much. And it's not necessarily on the reverse side. It's, I'm against the guys in girls' sports. But if you want to be a girl in a guy sport and get your bell rung, hey, that's – I mean, there's girls who play football, right? Yeah. And not under a trans flag. They're right. just girls who say, look, I want to play football. Yeah. I think they should be able to play football. Um, oh, yeah. if, I feel like if them and their parents are okay with it, then yeah. let them. I mean, you've got a biological offset you have to overcome. And if you're fast or, or whatever and you're able to do it, then – Congratulations. Okay. But I, what I don't want to see is skull fractures based off of two punches hmm. um, from a dude who says he's a woman. Yes. I see. I, I guess I really have nothing to add yeah, to this I, debate. I, I, was, I, was I, I, I just want to say that's very surprising to me that one issue could become such a salient factor in dividing a party. I, I honestly expected you to say that it was like a mix of multiple Factors. That's the only one I can. Yeah, we're all we're all Second Amendment, right? You're not gonna. You're all First Amendment. We're all. Oh. And like, really, the only thing that I've been able to find online is that one issue. Is they say that he's for trans in kids, and uh, but like, yeah, uh, and with with that trans in MMA, I I completely disagree with that as well because I read that article where. Two of the women were hospitalized after a couple weeks apart because obviously, you know, fighting is, but I was like, wow. And mm-hmm. I'm pretty sure one of the articles said it was two punches and he fractured one of their skulls. Broke their skulls. Yeah. Yeah. And it could be, I could be wrong on that, but. He's either one or two, but I, I went, yeah. And I saw his, the, his first fight and I mean, he wasn't even blocking because. I mean, yeah, it's like it's, you're gonna fight with your girlfriend and she's swinging on you and you just take it, right? Yeah, it's it is what mm. it's it's all he was doing. It's, I mean, for the for the sake, then, yeah, for the sake yeah. of argument, if somebody considers themselves, um, you know, to be someone who's born in the wrong body, and say that they had this feeling, uh, for a long time that it wasn't inoculated by a fad. Are there any individuals who you believe truly are part of this group, part of the con- group uh, of the conditions I described, where due to, I don't want to say like that they're an anomaly or that they're, uh, but, due, but due to the fact that there's variation mm-hmm. in the human population, right, natural variation, that there are some individuals that genuinely are uh, in need of like uh, trans care of I have term. a couple friends that are actually trans. Yes. That I, that I, and before I make any public statements, I have I ran my statements by them first yes. to see. Interesting. Um, to 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 get buy in because these are people that I actually respect. Uh, some of them were prior prior military service and yeah. and whatnot. And you know, by and large, they were all 
Um, they're anti-groomer, but you know they're they're pro mm. you know letting letting people make their their own decisions. Now to go back to yours. Um, the, the one person I can think of is uh, Caitlyn Bruce Jenner. Yes. Right now, Bruce was somebody I looked up to as a kid. He was a decathlon athlete, had his face on a Wheaties box. Hmm. I knew who he was. And, you know, he he has made his uh, adaption, um, I think, fairly well. And not not interfering with, you know, his, he was an excellent competitor as a male. Right? Yeah. I don't care who he runs against now. He's probably going to still beat them. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, so while I was shocked, the first couple, I mean, I started watching the, the, the Kardashian show when I like walked by and was like, is, is that Bruce in makeup? What, what the mm-hmm. hell is going on? So I was, you know, like trying to see where, where that was coming from and, and stuff. So I think he's done rather well. There's uh, a couple of people that I know who are just e- exceptional s- spokespeople for, um, the, the gay community, and I think they do well. Um, but I also feel like we have let something out of a bottle that we can't necessarily put back in. I see. And I'm concerned that a lot of it is pharmaceutical tied with doctors mm-hmm. and all of that being yeah. paid to to push this stuff on um, kids. I see. Uh, before we move on, the uh, last thing I'll say is from my understanding with that, with what you're saying, is some of the most expensive surgeries in healthcare is transitioning. So I, I could see what you're saying with that. And mo- I, in, I don't know how true this is, mm-hmm. but I hear that 75 to 80% of the guys who transition to women, they all keep their penises, 70 to 80% of them. So their their bottoms are secure, uh, but they just they mm-hmm. they do the top. So I'm not really sure how they expect to be called a woman <laughs> with penis yeah. between your legs. Yeah. Um, because I personally would be upset if uh, we were on a date and uh, that wasn't disclosed before. <laughs> I feel like oh, I, I can definitely agree on that. I can yeah. see that. Um, all right, so uh, we're going to move on to a different topic, although it, everything does relate. This is about election policy, and we wanted to ask, what's your logic behind the idea of instant runoff voting? Um, we've talked to people before who are very, very passionate about introducing more competition into the electoral system, and I was just wondering if you could elaborate so on that. The, I think we shall be on a third, or, or um, uh, what's that voting called? Ranked choice voting. Ranked choice voting. Yeah. Thank you. And there's a number of different models. Yeah. So it doesn't necessarily have to come down to RCV, but um, we use it in the party uh, often, and and I, I think it, a it's a better model, primarily because of where Chase came from. Right. He's coming out of Georgia, um, and Chase pretty much got his little rise to fame for splitting the vote, covering the spread, and then forcing them into a runoff. Well, I had, the season before that, I did the same thing here in North Carolina, um, but we didn't, we don't have runoff voting. They ended up going back and totaling things up, and they eventually gave it to, um, I guess maybe it was, it wasn't Bud. It was before that one. So it was uh, whatever his name is. Republicans hate him because he's Tillis. Uh, oh, Tom. Tom Tillis. Oh my god. Yeah. So I ended up splitting splitting them, but we didn't have runoff voting. Yeah. But it took a month for North Carolina to announce who the senator was. Yeah. Um. So I took great pride in that. Um. And so I ran again. <laughs> but um but so that's where he kind of he got three percent of the vote, covered yeah. the spread. Um but he had Herschel Walker and stuff in his, so it's already getting a lot of media attention. And it was really heated there. Yeah, and yeah. it got it got spicy. So I 
I think that is definitely a, 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 a many of these models are much better than what we what we currently have. But I would love to see rate choice voting brought to yeah. to North Carolina. Okay. It's cheaper, right? Because then you don't have these runoffs like you have in Georgia. Because you're we're talking millions of dollars and billions if you talk about how now they're going to go back and uh, you still have all the media attention and stuff um, to to pay for it. So, but at the same time. I don't think the two parties like it. I think they like things exactly the way they well, they are now. Because then the the only options I feel like with vote for voters on that is like if if someone wants Biden out, but they want to vote for right say Robert Kennedy because I'm a Kennedy guy. But one of the things that that we're always I'm always told is, well, would Biden wins again because you didn't vote for Trump? And it's like. Well, and I guess, in my opinion, and then I guess he wins, but, mm-hmm. like, a lot of people would be like, you know what, you're right, and they go vote for the person that they don't want to vote for. Right, and they use the waste of your votes and yeah. all of that. So ranked choice voting would give you the opportunity to say, hey, you know what, I want I want Shannon as my first choice. Uh, I don't even know who I'm running against. <laughs> uh, and, you know, other these other options could be, you know, two or three, and then based off of, how many of the votes they get, then, you know, yeah. the, the winner is decided. Um, yeah, much better than oh, yeah. our current system. Um, mm-hmm. uh, uh, my last question that I'll have is uh, gerrymandering. I believe I said that right. Because mm-hmm. um, a person, uh, Jeff Jackson, uh, he, he's been big on it because he's big on social media, posting videos about it, that he got gerrymandered out of his district. Um, hmm. So, as lieutenant governor, how would you be able to address gerrymandering in North Carolina? I think a five-year-old with crayon can do a better job <laughs> than a politician. So, that's what I'll do. I'll find a five-year-old with a crayon and be like, this is what I propose. We'll randomize it. <laughs> just, well, I mean, draw equal squares, you know, and... Be, because, you know, they just, they manipulate all wow. of us for votes. Cause, and cause, we do it every every election. We we redistrict everything. And I know they say that they do that because, like, with the cities expanding, they got to redraw it. But, like, one of the things that I heard was someone, and I think it was actually Jeff Jackson that said it, is uh, get outside people. Not politicians and no one that can be, and no corporations that are influencing with money. Get, get a committee of people. Have a Libertarian and, Party do it. <laughs> well, yeah, why not? We like, got get, no skin in the game. Yeah, well, well, not just that. Like, just uh, maybe, maybe find some some people on the street, some of the the people that are voters, and have them talk amongst themselves and try and make a fair. Well, uh, uh, as a, you know, as someone with a background in computer science, is there a role that technology can play well, in yeah, creating a fair district? Do it, but right. I mean, then you're not able to. Put all the black people in one, and the white people in another, or Republicans in one, yep. and Democrats that's, in another. And, that's that's mm-hmm. exactly what. Because one issue is is the actual fairness, and then the other issue is the perception of yeah. unfairness. Because if people perceive the tech company to be an interested player, then even that would face opposition. Oh yeah, yeah. Because mm-hmm. even even yeah. AI is biased. Right. Right. If you go into any of your AI engines right now and you try to ask a political question. It, it'll say, oh, no, but now it'll say it can't answer it because it's only a text-based engine or whatever. When it first came out, it was all Democrat. <laughs> like, it was like, this is a complex question and blah, 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 and you should, you know. Actually, that's something I do when I waste time is I try to get AI to, uh, to, to make politically incorrect <laughs> statements. I'm not going to go about it on the show, but it's just it's just so funny. I use AI for Damn near everything. And I, mm-hmm. I and so I I've seen I've seen things like that. Okay. Mm-hmm. Um, my political stuff, you know, I run through an AI engine and it'll help get resource and it may may not change my wording a whole lot, but it'll add resources and stuff so that I don't have to go look stuff up. Okay. So it's it's kinda cool. Next, um this is something new I wanna try and I've asked some friends to to help write questions for this podcast so I can bring in not just myself and Matt, but also others. And this is from Derek Mobley, who ran in uh, District 3 of Guilford County 
for a county commissioner. I was actually his lead recruiter and uh, a major publicist for his campaign. So he has a question about a situation happening in the town of Summerfield where a developer wants to build apartments that aren't allowed according to that town's zoning laws. And so he's petitioned, petitioning the NC legislature to actually de-annex that property from the town and to, to, to a, I believe, um, allocate it to Greensboro because Greensboro has more liberal zoning laws. And so this raises the question of whether the small government, um, sorry, sorry, if whether the government for the legislature should, should prioritize supporting the local autonomy of the town or to intervene on behalf of the individual's property because it's the individual who actually owns is the property an, and paid for it. Uh, eminent domain? No, no, no. This is, this is a very unique situation where a, a rich developer in Summerfield wants to annex his property, which is in Summerfield, and have his property be made part of Greensboro in order to be able to build the, the affordable housing apartments that he wants to build on his property. That's interesting. And to do that, the, so now he's now petitioning the legislature to annex that property from Summerfield into Greensboro because Greensboro has more liberal zoning laws that would allow and him to use his properties. The, two? Uh, the it, it, Summerfield is like right next to Greensboro. Okay. He, I think yes. His property is like right on the line, I think. Gotcha. Mm -hmm. And so he's asking for the, um, so the question now is from the libertarian perspective, right? Should the legislature, in the spirit of supporting small government, support the town or support support the individual? I think they should. Well, I think they should support the individual. Yes. Because that's that's uh, because the town is capable of bringing in then the uh, uh, the eminent domain to where they can even just take his land and put a hospital there. Right? Mm. So depending on and I'm, I oppose any of that. So I think uh, an individual, especially if he's living on the, uh, in my mind, it was like, oh, he's probably an hour away from Greensboro, but yet he wants to be the Greensboro annex. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, that won't work. Um, because of the utilities and all of that right. coming out of, of, of another town, it just doesn't make sense. But, you know, if he, if he, if he got them to redraw the, the city map, uh, that I, I mean, I would I would support his quest. Yeah. Uh, I don't expect the city now to to do it because they lose revenue, hmm. right? Because whatever he builds there, they're going to tax, right? And then they're going to impose whatever property value on right. it that is going to make them the most money because right. property tax is just a big scam too. I see. In fact, mm. the prices of your house is going up every Their year. Their prices aren't really neutral. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I That's that. an interesting I saw that one this year. <laughs> and first, first full year I owned a house, went up $100. And this, this goes into uh, questions of money and politics, too. Because the developer stands to make... It, so the way Derek phrased his question was, does it change anything if the developer stands to make a lot of money and has donated a lot to lawmakers to make this annexation happen? And... Um, given that there's been a proposed NC campaign finance law that will make it easier to get unlimited donations to candidates, what role should money have in politics for a libertarian? Well, I hate money in politics. I see. Um, I thought you were going to say that money is speech. Well, it is. Is that surprising? Well, it's, it's not, unfortunately, it's not good speech. Hmm. Cause I don't make, I don't make the news unless I, uh, either choke out my wife or, or <laughs> grow marijuana. My goodness. Uh, um, because it, you know, media is pay for play. Yes. Yeah. So it, it all comes down to, to money. Um, in fact, they will most likely spend when this race is all said and done, you know, over a billion dollars on this government governor race. Cause you, you have, uh, Robinson was basically handpicked by Trump. Right, you got Stein, who's gotten the Biden nod, um, and so in North Carolina is a swing state. We're about as purple as they can be. Um, we voted for Trump in the last presidential election. Uh, I'm assuming the state would probably go 
that way again. Um, but we're so close on. Well, and, and like like the thing that I like to look at too is like like I said, all those other people running. There's there's just no telling at this point. Yeah, it's it's a it. Um, I'm hoping that it's a libertarian free for all. Um, I would like to see Mike and I break records, um, mm-hmm. break my previous records, um, on, on bringing people in from outside the Libertarian Party to vote mm-hmm. and, uh, fundraising and, uh, fundraising is Libertarians tough because we, we're all, we have such a small community, um, and, you know, I feel bad going to my fellow Libertarians saying, hey, you know, give me a bunch of money. And I'm going to try my best to win, but no guarantee. I'm also working on that 3%, you know? Mm-hmm. So, uh, it, a lot of us run to maintain ballot access. I run for the fun of it. I enjoy it. I, I, I think spending $2,000 every two years to have the news media and all of that come ask me my opinion is fantastic. Mm-hmm. And, and, and- <laughs> On top of that, you sometimes get to throw a wrench in things. Sometimes I get to mess some stuff up. Right. Yeah. Uh, so, no, I I love being a career candidate, actually. Although, if I got voted, if I got elected, I would do it with honor. But I would, A, make less money. B, have less time. Hmm. Um, so, it's not necessarily something I want to do. But if I had the opportunity to go in there and libertarian some stuff up, Yes. I would do that with great honor. Um, but being a politician was never on my roadmap until Trump furloughed me like the fourth time. And mm-hmm. I was working for DOD and I was running out of savings because I kept not getting paid. Because mm-hmm. um, when the government shuts down, there went my paycheck. And you yes. got trash piling up in D.C. Well... That trash piling up in D.C. almost equated the amount of bills piling up in my house that weren't getting paid. Mm. Mm. Uh, which ultimately, um, Walter Jones died and, and left that vacancy open. And I I ran for Congress outside my district. Drove two or three hours every day to like New Bern and stuff to, to campaign um, just because I had nothing better to do. And I I loved it. Uh, outside being on the road part, you know, going out there and talking about politics and and listening to people who, if I talk to someone long enough, they will they will say I'm libertarian too, right? They're like, oh, I believe that. I believe that. I, oh, I'm, I'm, you know, and I'm I'm seventy five percent on the same page as most people, right? And mm-hmm. it's just the little nuances of, of things and. You know, um, some of them will never be libertarian enough, right, to vote <laughs> libertarian. Um, but, you know, the ideas of personal liberty and all of that really kind of attract them to most people. Now, when you start, they'll be like, well, how are you going to pay for the roads and stuff? Well, city point. Um, <laughs> what? Yeah, I was going to say. One of my answers. Um, you know, it, okay. it's, a, it's, a, it's a revenue generating to where, um, yeah, I have that written somewhere that I would... Um, I would I would like to explore City Coin, and then also the you know the North Carolina Gold Standard. Okay. But I agree that 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 get so much pushback, but it'd be cool if just to that, do the, it. But they do sound like interesting and uh, good ideas, especially the City Coin. Yeah. Uh, I mean, because like if because that's a possibility to make money, and then also you're supporting your city. Right. So. And that's where. That's the whole libertarian movement is about localization. Yeah. Right. We actually spend more effort on the auditors and city commissioners and all of those guys as a party than we do our statewide candidates. Wow. I see. Um, because we feel that the government should be close to home. Yeah. Right. Um, and and that's where real change is going to happen. And, and local effects day-to-day life more more yeah. yeah the reason why i run for the bigger ones is because nobody else does and i found a passion for it. yes and it also comes down to i have a pretty good job and i don't mind spending the two thousand dollars every couple of years as opposed to 
you know, they, they spend like a couple hundred dollars. Um, and, but I don't, I don't actually raise money. I just pay for everything myself. Yeah. Um, I, if somebody gives me a donation, I'll take it. But I, I, my battle for uphill doesn't need their money. Right. I, uh, it would be great to have a TV commercial and stuff like that. But if you gave me a million dollars, I wouldn't want to waste it on a TV commercial. I would rather put that money to where it's going to help the community Mm. as opposed to, um, helping myself, which sounds kind of the, I'm people get being a libertarian and the individualism confused with being selfish hmm. but it has nothing to do with us being selfish it's, it's just it's, yeah. this is me and mine and I don't want you messing with it um, as opposed to because um, I, I donate to all sorts of charities yes. and, and what not um, that's a whole different debate yeah but sure. it, that's that's my choice too Yes. versus you know I'd rather give my money to where I want it to mm. go than have the government come in. But it's about money. individual yeah, agency, yeah, would rather is what you say. Would rather give money to the Wounded Warrior Project than state tax. 100%. Yeah. Right. Wounded Warrior versus mm. bombing brown kids. Mm. Yeah. That's basically Choice. what it is. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Shannon, I think we have to wrap this episode. This has already gone a bit longer than most philosophizant <laughs> conversations. We've had, I have my recording time at two hours and 20 minutes now. And customer apology. <laughs> <laughs> that is okay. But thank you for appearing on Philosophism. Um, like I said, this will be edited and posted, and I encourage you to share this podcast out, and I encourage anyone listening to share this out so that these kinds of deep conversations, which I think, I hope, go much more in depth than the news and get to the heart of how people, people in office think. Um, than the soundbite type interviews that are only played for likes. This has been Philosophism. Shannon Bray, thank you for coming on. Oh, absolutely. Thank you for, for having me. The dog interrupted us again. <laughs> <laughs> Doesn't like politics. <laughs> <laughs>